Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our ongoing series of science sharing uh, webinars in Central Region. Uh, today's uh, speaker is Jenny Laughlin from WFO Kansas City Pleasant Hill, and she'll be telling us about some verification she has done of uh, RAP model soundings in the pre-convective environments. Uh, Jenny, it's all yours. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, usually when I do a talk in my office, I bring brownies, so I apologize. And uh, I'm glad you all joined, even though there was no promise of food. So thanks again for coming. Um, I'm going to pretend that we're going to have a convective season this year and talk about how the RAP does um, in pre-convective environments. And uh, it's just a little verification from 2012, um, but I think it'll be useful as we move into 2013 as well. Um, and again, I'm Jenny. I'm a forecaster here in Kansas City. Before I really jump in, I do want to thank a number of people for helping me out. Um, I did start this research up in Sioux Falls with Phil Schumacher, um, and he was really helpful getting this going. And then as I came down here, um, I've been working closely with Al, and he's given a lot of really good input. Uh, Jimmy C. down in Norman also gave me a lot of really good input and kind of helped lead me towards some of the conclusions that I got. Um, and also Scott Blair, Jeff Mannion, and uh, two reviewers from the Journal of Operational Meteorology um, have given a lot of really good input as well. And, kind of helps refine the study to where it is right now. So let's jump in. Um, as most of you know, the rapid refresh replaced the RUC last year. Um, it took effect on May 1st. Um, and usually due to its hourly updates and resolution, we've been using formerly the RUC and now the RAP uh, for severe weather forecasting, um, especially since you get those new updates every hour. Um, and just the resolution overall is really useful for severe weather. It was also used for SPC's mesoanalysis graphics. Um, I just got an email, I think, a few days ago that they've updated now to a new version of the RAP. Uh, but for last year and the spring before now, uh, they were also using that for their mesoanalysis. Before this was released, ESRL did a verification study. Um, as far as I know, it didn't include any convective or instability parameters. It's possible that they looked at them, but they were not released. Um, and you can kind of. They had tempster and dew point on there, so you can kind of start to get an idea um, of how some of the Kate profiles are, what that would look like. But unfortunately, their verification study also didn't cover the convective season, or at least the part that they released. Um, so I know there was a question in our minds, how is that going to perform in pre-convective environments, uh, especially since it came out right before the convective season and completely replaced uh, the rock. So here are some of the updates. Um, I've put the wrap on the left and the ruck on the right, um, just to kind of show some of the updates from the former ruck. Um, most things are pretty similar, same grid spacing, domain's a little bit bigger, uh, but our biggest things that I've highlighted here are the assimilation. Uh, that was updated and changed pretty significantly. And the planetary boundary layer scheme uh, was also updated, and that was a pretty significant change as well. So we'll come back to those, um, but I'll leave the slide up just for a minute. Uh, again, most of these updates were, were not real big, a new version of the microphysics, but still kind of the same one, um, updated land surface model. Uh, but overall, again, those big changes were the assimilation and the PBL scheme. So again, that leaves us with how these changes are going to impact our pre-convective environments. And that's essentially what this whole study will be about. So what we did um, looked at the 12Z run and the 18Z run of the wrap. Uh, so we're looking at the 12-hour forecast and the 6-hour forecast. Everything is valid at 0Z. Um, and then compared that to the 0Z observed soundings. And the reason I chose those times is that it's typically when uh, operational staff is starting to, to prepare for afternoon or evening severe weather. Um, we're thinking about updating the forecast. Uh, we're thinking about DSS, do we need to call additional people in? Um, so this is kind of the window of time when we're starting to really ramp up and prepare for severe weather. And so we need to know, really, is it going to be possible or not? The study goes from the 2nd of May, since that was the first uh, zero Z data that we had, um, through the 15th of July in 2012. Um, we didn't have a lot of severe weather during the summer of 2012, uh, so it kind of stops at the 15th of July. Um, but it, it gets a pretty big period in there. And again, zero-z soundings, um, I did eliminate the ones that had CAPE less than 500 joules per kilogram, uh, just because I wanted to get environments that could possibly become convective. Um, and I know there were a lot that were, they had some amount of CAPE, but they were extremely capped. Um, so I also used the SPC outlook for general thunder or 
also severe weather if that were the case. Uh, just to, again, try and get those environments where convection might be possible. I did have to throw out several where there was contamination from the convective parameterization, especially since we're looking at that zero-z time frame. A lot of times if there is going to be convection, it may have occurred at this point, um, and so would be screwing with the model sounding a little bit. Um, so I did eliminate those. And the way that I did that was just using BuffKit, uh, looking at the overall temperature and moisture profile over several hours, seeing if there was anything that maybe indicated the shallow convective scheme or the full convective scheme had activated. Um, and then I also looked at the model output to see if there was convection being produced um, either at zero Z or within the next hour, uh, which again would tell me that the convective parameterization may have activated and uh, might be screwing with the data a little bit. So anytime I saw that, I eliminated those cases. The upper air sites that I used were all in the central plains. Uh, the furthest north was in Rapid City. Uh, then also did North Platte, Omaha, Topeka, Dodge City, and Norman as well. Um, and again, we're looking at that period from May 2nd to July 15th of 2012 at these six sites. In total, after we eliminate um, all the cases that had the convective parameterization problems or uh, didn't have enough CAPE, we ended up with 56 total cases. And here's the breakdown. 18 of those were in May. Uh, 25 were in June, and 13 were in July. And it was pretty spread out over all the sites. Uh, we did have 12 from Rapid City, 9 from North Platte, 9 from Omaha, only 5 from Dodge, 7 from Topeka, and 14 from Norman. Um, and the way that I kind of looked at these soundings initially was just the overall sounding structure, um, forecast versus observed. I looked at them in BuffKit initially just to see uh, what were some of the differences and got a, kind of a qualitative overview of uh, the differences between the forecast and observed. And then I started to quantify them through CAPE and SIN, uh, looking at surface-based, most unstable, and the 100 millibar uh, mixed layer CAPE. And mostly I looked at uh, CAPE. SIN didn't tell me a whole lot. Um, a really small error can completely throw off your SIN forecast. Um, so mostly I was focusing on CAPE, and I'll show that in the next few slides. A few other things that I did consider, uh, did convective initiation occur within 100 kilometers? Um, since we were looking for those environments where it might be possible, wanted to check and see if that did actually happen. Uh, did severe weather occur within 100 kilometers? And overall, what I really wanted to know was what type of environment was producing errors when there were errors. So out of those 56 cases, CAPE was under forecast in 46 of them, which is quite a bit. Uh, the average surface-based CAPE error was over 1,000 joules per kilogram too low. Uh, these numbers are for those 46 cases because we had a few that were completely overestimated, and I know that that happened at the rock as well. So if you get a case where the observed was 4,000 joules per kilogram and the RUC or the RAF was forecasting 6,000, it's going to completely throw off your numbers. So these numbers are for the 46 that were underestimated. Uh, the average surface-based Cape error was, again, over 1,000. Same with most unstable Cape error. Um, the ML Cape error was a little smaller, uh, but if you look at the bottom half of the screen, also the average ML Cape was also lower. Uh, so overall, we're looking at a 30 to 50 percent error on average uh, for those 46 cases that were underestimated. And if we look at it graphically, you can start to flesh out um, what the type of magnitude of errors that we're seeing. The red is the observed, uh, the blue is the 12Z forecast, valid at 0Z, and the green is the 18Z forecast, valid also at 0Z. Um, so again, you can see that the observed was much higher in these cases. Um, and usually the forecast got a little better as you got to the 18Z run, but it's still pretty far off. Um, so these are the types of errors that we were looking at during the convective season last year. That doesn't tell you everything, though. If you look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, it actually tells you a lot more. Um, so this is, this is a little messy, but it's uh, observed surface-based CAPE is on the bottom. And then on the y-axis, um, you have on the left, it's the 12Z forecast surface-based CAPE, again, valid at 0Z. Um, and on the right panel, it's the 18Z forecast. Um, and so you can see for each individual case, and I included all 56 cases here, so you can see the ones that were actually overestimated. Uh, but you can see on a case-by-case -case basis how did the model perform um, and what type of value was it giving us versus the observed. And I do have the line on here, x equals y, uh, essentially a perfect forecast to give you an idea how many were below um, and how many were above. 
And you do see, especially on that 12Z case, there is just a couple of data points that are really overestimated. So again, that's why I threw those out when I was doing the numbers for how much it was underestimated, because you know, a forecast of over 3,000 joules per kilogram when it was supposed to be about 15 would throw off your averages a lot. So, but the thing to note from these graphs the most is that almost all of the cases were underestimated, and sometimes very significantly so. So one of the ways that I tried to look at all of these cases uh, was to see what happened in the worst cases. So when was our percent error the lowest? Um, and I chose the worst four cases uh, to kind of study in detail and really see what type of environment was this happening in and, and what exactly happened to cause the huge errors. Uh, so these cases were the 17th of May in Rapid City, uh, the 18th of May in North Platte, 19th of June in Rapid City, and the 3rd of July in North Platte. Um, all of these cases, again, they had over 500 joules per kilogram of CAPE, so they were selected for the study. Uh, but the forecast CAPE in most cases was extremely low, if not zero. Um, and so that's resulting in about a 90 to 100 percent forecast error uh, for these model soundings. Um, so obviously, in this case, there was convection possible. Um, and convection did occur, actually, in all of these cases after 0Z. But judging by the sounding and the value of CAPE that it's giving you, you might not expect that, because you've either got zero CAPE or you've got very minimal CAPE. Um, so again, in that planning period, you may think uh, that thunderstorms are not possible later in the day. And so we decided to look at it from a synoptic perspective to see if we could start finding an environment where this type of thing is happening. Uh, the stars indicate where the sounding was taken. So the two on the left are from Rapid City, um, and the two on the right are from North Platte. And it's, again, those four cases that I just introduced. And you're not really seeing a pattern. It could be anything from slight ridging to a short wave trough to zonal flow. Um, and again, this is uh, 300 hectopascal streamlines, um, as well as the upper air plots and the shaded jet. Uh, so this is just giving our synoptic overview of these cases. And we're really just not seeing a pattern so far, um, at least at the upper levels. Again, moving to 500 millibars, um, looking at heights, upper air plots and contour temperature, although I know that's really hard to see. But same story, we've got anything from ridging to gradual southwest flow to a shortwave trough. Um, so really not seeing a pattern at the mid-levels or the upper levels as well. And then as we move to 850, the only real similarity that I see here, um, generally southerly flow at the surface, and you do see here we've got contoured um, temperature and dew point at 850. And so you do see that these cases uh, are mostly out of the best moisture, um, typical of high plains. Um, but that's really the only thing that you see that's really similar. So from a synoptic perspective, we're really not seeing something that draws these cases together and would indicate that we might be seeing huge errors in our uh, CAPE forecast from the wrap. If we look at soundings, we start to see a little more. Um, this is that Rapid City case from the 17th and the North Platte case from the 18th. Um, and I've overlaid the soundings here. It's the observed sounding is the red. Um, the 12Z forecast, again, valid at 0Z, is blue. And the 18Z forecast is in green. Uh, so you can start to see the temperature profile looks actually pretty good. Uh, but the moisture is where we're starting to really have some problems. Um, and even the uh, 18th of May in North Platte, it doesn't look like that big of an error. But um, if you do see, I've got the Cape and Sin listed below it. It uh, really throws off your overall values just to have kind of that small, very low-level error in moisture. Um, and so that's the type of thing that we see in these two cases. Um, and then as the next two as well, uh, you're really seeing that same. I'm not sure what happened with that 12 degree forecast in the Rapid City on the 19th. Um, but again, you're seeing these huge errors in moisture, uh, which are leading your CAPE to be a much, much lower than it should be um, and could cause forecasters not to anticipate uh, convective initiation later in the day, because it's forecasting that essentially all this is going to mix out. Um, the only real temperature error, you start to see it a little bit on that 19th of June case. Um, the only real error that you're seeing there, it's pretty much dry adiabatic. Uh, the only thing that you really see is that if it becomes super adiabatic at the surface, it does warm a little too much. Um, and we'll talk about that a little later. But again, the biggest errors that you're really seeing are in that moisture profile. And I've zoomed in on the low levels, because that's really where the problems are occurring. Uh, obviously, you do see on that 12Z on the 19th, 
the whole sounding looked pretty bad. Um, but most of the errors are really occurring in that near surface to boundary layer uh, layer. So in those four cases, these are again the four, four worst forecast cases. They're occurring in multiple types of synopting environments, uh, not seeing really a pattern there. Uh, but the soundings that we looked at do indicate notable errors in that boundary layer moisture, fairly small errors in temp. And again, I think that's mostly because it's adhering to the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Uh, so you really couldn't mix any further than that. Um, and that's why the, the forecast is doing OK. Uh, but again, you did see that super adiabatic layer near the surface on some of the model forecasts. And I know here in Kansas City last year, that led the RAPS2 forecast to high of, I think, 114 on a couple days, um, which actually wasn't that far off. But we did not get above 110. So it gives that little super adiabatic layer at the bottom, and that's going to eliminate some of your CAPE and also lead to some pretty outrageous uh, temperature forecasts. In all of those cases, there was enough observed CAPE for convective initiation to be possible, and it did occur in all of those cases. Uh, but the way that the RAP was handling it, we may not have anticipated it. Um, and also, it wasn't just that low CAPE. The RAP also never activated its convective parameterization. didn't happen later in the day. Um, it just didn't happen at all. So again, that may lead forecasters to think that there may not be convective initiation later in the day. If we look at the four cases um, in an a composite sounding, and again, these are the observed zero-z soundings. So I composited the four observed soundings for those four cases to look at the type of environment that this is occurring in. So these are the observed soundings um, all meshed together. And you see the type of environment where you're starting to get errors. It's very dry, uh, very steep low-level lapse rates. And again, the the uh, boundary layer is also very dry, so you end up with a super high LCL, um, a high LFC. And you can kind of tell overall, even though it's very unstable uh, in the boundary layer, it's probably going to be a low CAPE environment uh, just because your LCL, LFC are so high. Uh, so this kind of looks like your typical high plane sounding. Um, and it kind of looks like all of those soundings that we previously saw, where they're pretty similar, pretty unstable, uh, but also very dry. If we compare those four worst forecasts, that's on the left now. Um, if we compare that to the best forecasts, the observed soundings for <coughs> the four cases that were forecast the best by the RAP, um, <coughs> we see some pretty significant differences. Again, the, on the left, the four worst forecasts are pretty dry, pretty unstable. And then as you move to the ones that were forecast the best, uh, you're a lot more moist in the boundary layer. Um, not necessarily as unstable through the entire boundary layer. Uh, you do have near the surface those dry adiabatic lapse rates, uh, but then you change as you go aloft. And that leads to your overall lower LCL, especially with that higher moisture near the surface, um, and a lower LFC. So probably leading to a higher CAPE environment um, for the ones that were being the best forecast by the RAP. So those worst CAPE forecasts are occurring mainly in drier, warmer environments like we saw earlier. Uh, they're occurring with a deeper boundary layer. You can see that from the higher LCL and LFC. Generally steeper low-level lapse rates, especially as you get a little bit further off the surface. Um, and like I said before, this is that typical high plains environment, very dry, very unstable. Um, and if you did notice, the four worst forecasts, two of them are in Rapid City and two of them are in North Platte, so again, getting into the high plains. Um, and the best forecasts were actually two of them were at Topeka and two of them were at Norman, um, so where you typically not expect as much of that uh, high plains environment. Unfortunately, you did see earlier with those 46 cases, there were several. I think the most, actually, 14 were in Norman, um, and there were several that were not in high plains environments. But in 2012, it was so dry and so hot that almost our entire central plains were moving into that high plains environment. Um, so I think that's really also why we noticed this so much last year. Um, how we had those huge errors is that we're starting to all move into this high plains environment, at least for last year's convective season. Um, and so we saw a lot of these errors. And you know, I think that's, that's probably partially why is that we're starting to get this high plains environment everywhere. And we can also see these are two scatter plots of the dew point depression at 0 Z. Um, this is the observed dew point depression. And then the forecast percent error. So this is surface-based CAPE uh, forecast percent error from the 12Z wrap and the 18Z wrap. 
And you can also, this is for all 56 cases, so you can start to see as your uh, dew point depression increases, you're also decreasing or becoming more negative with your percent error. Um, so you're really getting into the cases that were very far under forecast um, were also extremely dry. So it gives you a better idea um, in a total sense of the types of environments where these errors are occurring and um, how dry they are, especially at the surface. So most problems are occurring in the near surface layer through the boundary layer, uh, which kind of leads us to questioning what's happening with the planetary boundary layer scheme, especially because it's different from the rock. And I don't recall seeing this magnitude of errors uh, when we were looking at the rock. Um, so the planetary boundary layer scheme in the RAF is the MYJ. Um, and there was actually a study that came out in 2010. Uh, I think who it all looked at three different uh, planetary boundary layer schemes in the WARF ARW, which is also the core of the RAP. Um, and they found that the MYJ might actually be the least accurate scheme that you can use in the WARF ARW. Um, they found a lot of errors with that. And they also quoted um, Yannick 2002, which is actually the paper that introduced the MYJ, uh, saying that the MYJ is appropriate for stable and slightly unstable flows. Uh, but as you get more unstable, um, you're likely to have more errors. So those cases that we were seeing where we were very unstable throughout the whole boundary layer could be introducing some errors with that PBL scheme um, not being completely appropriate for that unstable environment. The errors in the low-level moisture were noted by uh, ESRL, and they did make some updates. Uh, they are now running RAP version 2 experimentally at ESRL. Um, and I know that's the version that SCC just updated to about a week ago. Um, and out of all the changes, the RAP version 2 uses a different planetary boundary layer scheme. Um, so that was one of the things that they did change. And they also improved the assimilation of the surface observations, because they were noticing that that uh, moisture was generally too low, uh, especially in convective environments. And so this presentation from the Ezreal folks in 2012 at the SLS, uh, they showed actually a lot of different convective storm environments with the RAP version 2. Uh, and they saw a lot of improvement. So it's possible that out of all the changes that they made, especially that update to the planetary boundary layer scheme, um, and probably also the assimilation of the surface observations, uh, are really, really starting to improve some of these errors that we're seeing. So RAP version 2 is available online uh, for you to look at and compare to the RAP that we're getting from NSEP. Um, and so that'll really also help kind of flesh out where the errors are occurring and what might be causing them, um, and possibly pointing again to that planetary boundary layer scheme or the assimilation of the surface. So we'll just do a quick summary. Um, the convective season 2012 RAP model forecasts were, again, significantly underestimating buoyancy. Uh, the underestimation seemed like it was primarily a result of errors in the boundary layer moisture, uh, which resulted in underestimation of CAPE of 1,000 joules per kilogram or more. The largest errors that we did see tended to occur in dry, unstable environments, and also those with a well-mixed boundary layer, um, again, leading to those higher lapse rates and those warmer temperatures at the surface. And that also led to that high LCL. And as you start to warm that up and dry that out more, which is what the model was doing, you get an even higher forecast LCL than what's already occurring, um, and that further lowers your CAPE. And so you end up either eliminating all or almost all of your CAPE um, in a lot of those cases. So just a few takeaway points. Um, always be wary of temperatures and dew points from model forecasts, uh, but especially on days where you've got really dry mid to low levels and abundant surface heating um, anytime you're getting into kind of that classic high plains environment. Um, using other model solutions will really help because they all have different PBL schemes, and so they're all probably going to be handling this a little differently. Uh, so it helps to see what, what else is going on out there. And again, you could compare that to the RAP version 2 as well online. Um, also, there's a lot of other options to look at for the probability of convection. Uh, tons of high-res model output out there. Um, you could even ensemble the high-res data to start looking at the conditional probability of convective initiation. Um, how often are those high-res models producing convection? Um, and starting to look at that as your probability of severe weather in addition to, uh, to values just like CAPE um, and model soundings. Um, and again, that's also useful for convective mode. So it's, it's useful for more than just your conditional probability of convection or severe weather. And it's also important to note that the HERS parent model is the RAP version 2. Uh, so it's 
taking advantage of those updates. Um, and the HERS been, as far as I know, performing really well. Uh, so that's also another tool that you can look at as you're trying to figure out maybe what's happening in the NSAP version of the RAP um, and how it's performing. And I always encourage you to run and tweak a local version of the WARF ARW, because uh, I think probably in different convective situations, maybe even uh, nocturnal convection versus afternoon, uh, maybe squalline versus supercells, there could be different parameterizations that work better for each of those situations. And so you can do local studies and figure out what's going to work the best for us, uh, what works best for our neck of the woods, and maybe for this type of environment, what works best. And then you can go in the back and tweak it, run it the way you want it, um, and get your own output. So it's always useful to have all these tools, um, and I definitely encourage you to, to do some local modeling and, and see if that helps and gives you a, just another answer that you can kind of look at and compare to uh, the operational model. So I know that was pretty fast. Um, that's basically all I've got for you today. This is in publication right now in the uh, Journal of Operational Meteorology. So that should be out probably later this month, if not early next month. Um, so that will have some more details in it as well if you'd like to check it out. Otherwise, uh, thank you again for attending, and I can take any questions that you might have. Jeff in Milwaukee. Uh, uh -huh. I, just for clarification, I, um, we, you defined the different Cape values at the beginning, and then later you just said Cape. We were assuming that was surface-based, but it, it, what were the values you were showing in the uh, actual graphics and the examples? Yeah, most of the graphics and examples, um, if I didn't define it, was surface-based case. And in most cases, the surface-based and most unstable were the same, because um, these were all these really well-mixed environments. Um, so most of the time, that parcel would have been lifted from the surface. So I did use surface-based cape for most of those. OK. Uh, the other question is, did you use a virtual temperature correction or uh, just a standard calculation of cape? No, I did not. I used just a standard calculation, um, and that was both with uh, the model soundings. I was using Rayob. Um, so for the model soundings and for the observed soundings, I did not use the virtual temperature correction. Now, and then my last question is, in, you showed the, the mean values for uh, some of these worst case uh, verification scenarios. Uh, my question would be, how significant is that skin layer moisture in actually producing uh, a convective cloud? You said that you had uh, thunderstorms on all of those soundings after 0Z. Uh, how likely was it that the environment changed? Because in, in general, what we found at SPC is that the, the surface-based parcel is often, when you have a a skin layer contact of moisture, yes, you get a higher value of CAPE, but in general, the impact on the actual convection is better assessed from a mean layer. It's a, it's a better match to the LCLs of the actual clouds observed. So is it possible the environment changed after 0Z with the nocturnal jet, or is, are we talking just an hour or two after 0Z? Yeah, it's definitely possible that the environment was changing. Um, and there may be other factors um, that would have influenced convection beyond just you know heating the surface and getting unstable. Um, usually when I looked for convection to occur later, I stopped at about 4Z because I didn't want to get into an environment that might have changed. And you know it could have changed in four hours as well. Uh, but just as kind of an overview to see if it actually did occur, I looked in a, about a four-hour window after uh, that 0Z sounding. Um, and I agree with the, the ML cape is probably an overall better representation. And we still did see kind of a, a similar magnitude of errors. It's just that the ML cape was so much smaller as well that you see overall total errors that are also smaller um, and, and somewhat less impressive. Um, but again, it's that 30 to 50% error on average for all those underestimated cape uh, cases was also for ML cape as well as surface-based cape. It's just the, the total error was smaller. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Hi, this is uh, Aaron at Dodge. Uh, great talk. Uh, the, the one comment I had was the uh, fact you have a, a very zero-z-centric study. I guess we've got to be careful with making uh, broad generalizations when 
we're not quite sure how this is behaving during the, uh, let's say, the overnight hours or the early morning hours. So just a quick comment. Yeah, definitely. And I originally, when I started the study in Sioux Falls, I wanted to do special soundings. Uh, but then I realized that was capturing a bunch of different kinds of environments because special soundings aren't always at 18Z or 21Z. Um, and so that would kind of introduce some uh, possible errors there, too, as well. So there's definitely some caveats uh, looking at the 0Z sounding and looking at soundings that didn't convect at 0Z or prior to 0Z. So that definitely um, is a caveat in there. But maybe you take it as for 0Z soundings, if you're seeing your cape mixed out like in the late afternoon, uh, that could be a key to, to where the study may be applicable. Thank you, Jenny, for a uh, great talk today. We sure appreciate it. Thanks, Don. You're most welcome. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today.